right, well, let's go ahead and get started, Cameron. I appreciate your being with us today on Wise Council Live. Uh, Cameron Kirchhoff, uh, you have been uh, specializing in, in Medicare for, uh, what, 18 years, I think you said, coming up on your 18th anniversary doing this. And um, we make it a point at our firm to, to find out, uh, you know, who in our area is really good at what they do, because as you can imagine, doing what we do, for clients, uh, this is a, a discussion that comes up pretty often. And, um, you know, the old saying, a man's got to know, know his own limitations. We, we know a lot about a lot of things, but we also know our limitations. And so when we get into some, uh, some of these areas like, like Medicare, it's just such a, a blessing to us to know people we can refer clients to for, you know, next level advice. And so, um, that's kind of how we view you. And uh, so we're glad to know you and, and, and you just happen to live in our own community. So that's awesome. Um, Cameron, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you came to specialize in this. And, and then we'll, uh, we're just going to talk about some basic ideas around Medicare today and, and help people understand what that looks like when they, they get to 65 and, and kind of how that all, how that all works. But let's start off by just giving you a chance to tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Yeah. So, um, Got licensed and set up uh, August 2nd, 2002. Uh, went after the health insurance market, wanted to learn more and see if I could help out being self employed myself. Um, the funny thing is, Medicare kind of took over within about, I would say, a four year period of doing both because so many people started asking about it and, and saying, Hey, I, can you help me out? Can you help my parents out? And next thing I knew that couple years later, it was nonstop Medicare. My name got out, people referring, needing help and understanding why. And so uh, 2007 is when March of 2007 is when I went ahead and became fully independent and started Texas Healthcare Specialist. And um, 2010, moved out here to, to Sun City and uh, been saying the word Medicare almost every day. So yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're kind of in a business with the wind in your sails right now. We've got this massive baby boom generation working its way through uh, aging. And um, I'm, I'm in that group. I'm, I'm kind of towards the end of it, but I'm part of it. And I think uh, everybody has probably heard the stat that, that uh, once boomers started turning 65, there's so many of them that on average about 10,000 a day are turning 65. And that is going to continue to be the case until 2030. So there's still another 10 years of boomers that are, that are going to be coming up on this age 65. And that's kind of the magic age when it comes to Medicare. Um, so let's just kind of start with the basics and, and define for people, because a lot of times people don't understand Medicare Part A versus Part B they hear about Part D, you know, just kind of start with the basics and break that down for us. What's yeah, the difference of, and what do they cover? A lot of confusion on, on do you need it, when you need it, what is it? Um, so the government offers Part A and Part B, uh, put them together, it's known as Original Medicare. Part A is going to be your inpatient hospitalization services, and for most it doesn't cost anything. Uh, I tell people as long as you have your 40 quarters paid in or 10 years worth of Medicare, that's hospitalization portion of your insurance isn't going to cost you anything. Uh, now B, which to an extent is elective, but we'll get into that here in a second, that's uh, going to engulf all of your outpatient services. Um, and when I say all of it, we're talking about the actual services that you need, not saying that you're getting 100% coverage. Uh, that portion of your original Medicare Part B. It does have a monthly premium. Uh, this year, the standard premium is $144.60 um, for individuals to sign up for. Those two alone, A and B, or Parts A and B, that's going to give you your original Medicare. Now, people have heard since 2006 when it hit the streets, 2003 when it was signed into law about B, the drug coverage, um, that was a law that the government wrote, but then farmed it out to the insurance companies and said, I right, make a plan that equal to or better than. And as of 2020, there's in our area, 30 different prescription drug plans that you can choose from. And they all fall along, but they all have their, their own makeup. Yeah. Well, so, um, so the, 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 just to go back to something you said about Medicare part a, um, I know that, 
we, we have this impression that we don't pay anything for it, but we really do, right? We're paying payroll taxes our whole working life. And for people who are self-employed, they're paying both sides of that. Um, I guess it's what 2.9 percent, and it's uh, and it's unlimited. So um, you know you have a cap on what you pay for your social security tax, but not your not your Medicare tax. So that that tax can can add up to some dollars over the years. But once you retire or once you get to 65, and you, you, if you don't have earned income, you're not paying that tax anymore. And so so that's just kind of a a difference in how they fund these programs. Uh, I didn't realize that Part D was already up to 30 different options. Yeah. Um, it's just crazy. Uh, so do I need it is a basic question on Medicare. You know, let's, let's talk about that. Is it even possible not to opt in and, and do you need it? And, you know, just kind of speak to that a little bit. So uh, rule of thumb is everybody gets Medicare Part A. Uh, I'll put a little asterisk there and come back to it. The first day of the month, they turn 65. Mm -hmm. um, meaning they're eligible for it. It's sitting right there again at no additional cost as long as you pay those 40 quarters in. Um, when you have that option sitting there and the asterisk to come back to is individuals now that are covered through a group employer sponsored plan that have transitioned to the HSA or the high deductible style of plans, the way that Part A is built can actually be postponed a little bit if you continue to work. But in a rule of thumb, first day of the month, you turn 65, part A is right there. No matter if you're working, no matter if you're retired, no matter what the situation is, if you want it, you can have it. Part B, on the other hand, would be for any and everybody at age 65 who is not covered by a group employer-sponsored plan. Okay. A lot of people get confused and get worried because of the infamous penalty for not taking part B when you sign up. But rule of, the rule with Medicare is as long as you are an active employee, not retired, pulling off of their insurance bill, but actual active employee or the spouse of an active employee and not on COBRA, then you don't need Part B if you're going to stay with that employer-sponsored insurance coverage. Anybody and everybody else, they need to sign up for Part B. And you can do that three months, the first day of the month, three months prior to your 65th birthday month. Well, that's a great point. Um, you know, there, we've got so many people we work with that are still, and I think this is kind of um, a generational thing with the boomers we're seeing. Um, even if they don't need the income, a lot of them are working beyond 65, many of them well into their 70s. And uh, so in those cases, uh, I, if I heard you correctly, they're not compelled, as long as they're an active employee, uh, they're not compelled, nor is their spouse compelled to enroll in Medicare at 65. I guess it's still available to them if they wanted to do it, but they don't have to. Now, mm -hmm. what, when do they have, when, when, for those people, let's say they work till they're 70, um, and, and now their spouse isn't working, when, how, do, how does the sign up rule for them work? So there's, when, when you go past your three months before the month of three months thereafter, that is called your in, initial election period to sign up for Medicare. Mm -hmm. uh, you continue to work, say to age 70, you can't just jump online like you could when you're 65 and say, hey, I want Medicare, call Social Security. Uh, two very simple forms, one completed by the individual, one completed by someone, say in HR uh, with a company, which is an employment verification form. Those two forms have to be taken down to Social Security and pretty much given and said, hey, I want my Medicare Part B to start, fill in the blank on whatever first day of the month. If you call them up, didn't have the employment verification form, they're not going to sign you up or they're going to tell you you're going to get penalized because you haven't had credible coverage. So back to your question, if somebody called me up and said, hey, Cameron, I'm 65, I'm still working, I like my insurance at work, do I have to take Part B? My answer is no. Then the next question to me is, well, when I do decide to retire or step away, when do I need to contact you or get signed up for Medicare? Rule of thumb there is three months out. So if you can get a head start on, if you're gonna retire at the end of this year and you're 70 years old and you know that Medicare is fixing to start, we'll get a head start on that around October. Cause they're also gonna ask you if you want your social security benefits or 
depending upon if you want to push them off until you can. Uh, but yeah, the, the three months ahead of the game is always a great rule of thumb, no matter if you're turning 65 or if you're retiring and past age 65. Okay, well, that's great to know. It, are, are there any circumstances where somebody is eligible for Medicare before they reach age 65? That is, yeah. So um, end-stage renal failure or, or uh, kidney failure, um, ALS, and anyone who is disabled or deemed disabled 24 months after, and sometimes that can be retroactive back depending upon the situation of, uh, those scenarios come into play where you'll get your Medicare A, have the option for B before turning age 65. Okay. What about for widows? Uh, do they do they have any exception for widows? No, no. I, so uh, the only scenario there would be your Social Security income that you could pull. But as per right. Medicare, no, it, it, the health insurance portion isn't. Okay. Yeah. Well, we run into this. Uh, what we call it the gap period. From a lot of people uh, retire or leave work um, before sixty five, and then they've got a they got to figure out ways to bridge that gap. And, and so it's always this game to see, okay, what do we got to do to get to 65? Sometimes they'll use COBRA to, to eat up 18 months of that, but then there might be this additional window. And that's a discussion for another day, you know, what those options are. But um, assuming that we're, we're, we're still focusing on that age 65, you and I talked a little bit ahead of time about time frame, and you've already touched on this a little bit, but let's just make sure that we've really got this clear for people. So if, if let's say that I'm 64 and I, and I, I know I've got a year off uh, and you talked about three months, but is there, is there anything I should be doing before that three months or thinking about, um, you know, is, is there anything else that, that I should be thinking about at that stage or do I just kind of wait until it, it's almost, it's almost here. I've got three months and I'm either going to go and, and figure it out on my own or I'm going to call somebody like you. Yeah, so if I could make a, a, a perfect new client walking into the door, I would want that client to not do absolutely anything until three months out. And then that way, <laughs> that way they don't get full of a whole bunch of stress, a whole bunch of uh, maybe some misconceptions that are out there uh, and allow me to explain the education of and how to get it set up. That's a perfect world. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, I have clients that will start two years out. There are clients that wait till the day before. Um, is there absolutely something that has to be done? No. Um, if you want education, be careful. There's a lot of people that will uh, sell you something. Good resources, um, medicare.gov. Make sure it's .gov, not .com. <laughs> um, Medicare has tons of publications out there. Choosing a Medicare, uh, choosing a Medigap policy, uh, that's a great publication. I've read it way too many times. Every year, there's a Medicare and You book uh, that uh, once you turn 65 or become eligible for Medicare, they break it down. It's not the most exciting reading, uh, but for those that want a little education, those are really two good options to dig into. Okay. So one of the things that surprised, surprised me um, when I first realized this was that um, the, the people who, want, who are inclined to, maybe they don't want the hassle or what they think is going to be a hassle of talking to somebody who sells insurance um, or, you know, that they, they think it's going to cost them more uh, to work with somebody who is a specialist in this area. Um, it, I was a little surprised to learn that basically they, it doesn't cost them anything more because I it, explain how these we're, we're going to we're going to talk about some of the you know what, what's Medicare supplement what's Medicare Advantage we'll talk a little bit about that in a second but what, what are some of the choices I mean it, there's there's just the mechanical thing of signing up for Medicare right uh, but then there's some choices involved. It, I guess that mainly gets into the, the Part D and the supplements, but just speak to that a little bit. And in the, in the, in, in the thing that surprised me is that if you, if you can find somebody you can trust who really knows this stuff, and I think you are one of those people, um, 
does it, does it cost me anything more to work with you than it does for me to go figure this out on my own and, and look at my choices and, and choose for myself what I want to do? Yeah, that's a, that's a real good question because there's, even me, I'll squeeze a penny as hard as I can. And if I think I'm smart enough to go out there and, and, and figure out something on my own or do something on my own, that's just my mentality. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I have told people for years, with the way that we're set up, the way that we educate, the way that we offer our plans does not cost the consumer an absolute penny. And so the cost of the plans are exactly the same. Uh, the plan offerings are exactly the same. We don't have anything special here. That's all designed between the insurance companies and the State Department of Insurance. The difference being is we get paid by the insurance carriers for the services we provide to our client. And this is one reason why I'm a broker uh, by definition, other than just say an agent for ABC insurance company is because I learned a long time ago, everybody's risk retention, everybody's budget, everybody's needs are different. And so I wanna be able to offer any and everybody that walks through the door a plan that meets their needs. What they need to know is they get to utilize me year after year and not have to worry about getting an invoice for me or, or worrying about, well, if I set this appointment with Cameron, it's gonna cost me X amount of dollars to where I get paid by the insurance company. Yeah. So that, that takes a little pressure off of the scenario as well. Also, I tell people, look, if you went on your own and purchased ABC Insurance Company, and here's a little secret, all insurance plans go up on you. They, there isn't a single one out there that hasn't ever had a rate increase. When, when that happens and you call that ABC Insurance Company to see what else is there, they're only going to talk to you about their product, right? Yeah. It's an ever moving market, um, plans change, people's needs change. And so if that rate increase or if that need uh, change comes along, reaching out to a broker like myself, we're gonna be able to show you more than just what's in that one bag we have a full portfolio of. So, so put, put, some, put a fence around some of the choices people have to make. I mean, I, we, we talked briefly about part D and you said there could be as many as 30 plans I guess those plans have to be approved by the state board of insurance. And, and so once they're approved, they're there, they're options, whether you're going direct or whether you're working with somebody like you, that's one bundle of choices I have to sort through as a consumer, so to speak. What are, what are some of the other choices I'd be faced with? Yeah. And, and, and that's where I think it becomes overwhelming. Uh, just hearing that 30 different prescription drug plans, um, you know, ultimately, it, and it's rare nowadays, but I still see it every once in a while. The biggest thing that people need to know, well, I'm just going to go with what the government provides. I'm just going to go with original Medicare Part A and B. That will pick up most of your bill. The problem being is, and I've let people know this from the get-go, it will never kick in at 100%. Most people look at Medicare, original Medicare as an 80-20 type coverage. Mm -hmm. It's a good rule of thumb. It's not exact, but good rule of thumb to go by. Well, Take this example. If you have original Medicare, you're paying your 144.60 for your Part B, nothing extra for your Part A. You get diagnosed with cancer. You have a $300,000 cancer treatment bill. You owe 60 grand because that's 20% of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where finding something, these extra parts, putting that fence around just to protect against that risk comes into play. You got Part D, which the government doesn't force you to take part D, but if you don't, you're gonna get penalized. Uh, that's something to, to note in itself. Um, that's, D was designed to offer Medicare beneficiaries outpatient prescription drug coverage. So it's a, it's a must. But when it comes to protecting that 60,000, 20% left over chemo bill, you got a good couple options. You can keep Medicare and add what they call a Medicare supplement or the government calls them Medigap plans, since the name fill in the gaps of. And there's 11 different plans you can choose from there, not companies, 11 plans uh, that go along with. And then you have what's been out since 2006, Medicare Part C, also known as Medicare Advantage. Um, without getting too deep into that, that is where a private insurance company steps in as the risk receiver, meaning they're going to receive your bills for your services versus the government. 
so they're they're funded by the government to take a little pressure off. Plan designs are a little bit different, um, but I'll have to meet the needs of original Medicare um, parts A and B. So, and the gambit of things, you got original Medicare A and B, kind of hit on that. If you want to fill in the gaps or not be open ended on the insurance, you got to choose from a Medicare supplement, which there's 11 to choose from, or Medicare Advantage plans, which are county based. And in Williamson County, I think there's 21 or 24 <laughs> different plans really? you wow. can choose from there. And then you need a prescription drug plan, uh, which again, there's 30 options there. So it is over the years, it's become a lot, uh, especially for an individual that doesn't deal with it on a daily basis. And every year, once you're, uh, let's say you get, you're coming around to 66 now, um, or whatever the, the enrollment period is every year, I guess it's at the end of the year, right? Um, you, you can just ride with what you've got and accept whatever premium increases in all of these categories, or you're kind of a consumer all over again, right? You've got to go in and like you were saying earlier, if you call your current carrier, they're going to be an expert in their own plan and answer your questions, but they don't, they don't know a clue about those other 10 plans and they're certainly not going to promote them. Right. Right. Um, so having somebody like you, number one, you're staying up on what's going on with all these different options and, and you don't, you, you don't have any particular reason to have them with one company versus a different one. Um, so you're going to, you're going to give them advice based on what you see out there and all of those options. That's correct. Yeah. So one of the things I personally do, and I'm, I'm sure there's other agents that do as well, you, you hit on that uh, turning 66 or that annual um, period. So October 15th through December 7th, um, every, well, yes, that, that's what's known as the annual election period. Uh, I'm getting ramped up uh, about mid-September. Uh, my clients, depending upon what side of the roadmap I call it that they're on, original Medicare supplement or Part D or just a Medicare Advantage plan, they get a reminder letter, you know, hey, it's about that time of year. Hey, this is what I need from you. If you like it, keep it. It's going to roll over into the next year. If you want to review, come see me, give me a call, shoot me an email. Uh, but yeah, as, as long as I've done this, I can tell you that year after year, more and more companies, and it, you hit on it, it's the baby boomer generation. More and more companies want a piece of that pie, so they're all offering different things. You got Joe Namath on TV last year talking about how great his plan was. And I had about 200 emails saying, I want the plan that Joe Namath has. And I, don't, I don't even know what he has. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that cracks me up. People still love Joe Namath. Oh, yeah. Well, there, there's one other thing that we, uh, I want to touch on before we, we kind of wrap, wrap it up because we're coming close on time. We got about five or six minutes left. Um, this doesn't affect a ton of people, but when it does affect you, it gets your attention. And that's this IRMA uh, surcharge that you pay on your Medicare Part B premiums. You referenced earlier this, the normal premium uh, for, for once you are 65 and enrolled, right? It goes up a little bit each year, but right now it's $140.66 a month. And so if you happen to be married, you can, you know, you can put that times two, right? So that's, that's almost $300 a month. But if you happen to be blessed uh, with a large sale of property with a lot of capital gain, or you happen to have a large income, um, you know, you, all of a sudden you're paying a surcharge on top of that potentially. So I thought it'd be good to at least kind of explain that because I we get a call every now and then from somebody and they're like, "What in the world? I just got this letter." And we're like, "Well, yeah. you know, that's that's based on your tax return a couple of years ago, and it's going to take a year before you're you know maybe you're through with that." So speak to that a little bit and explain how that works. Yeah, so Irma is short for income uh, related monthly adjusted amounts, and what happens is when you sign up for Medicare Part B. Uh, you get a nice little letter saying, congratulations, your Part B is going to start on the first day of September. Two weeks later, you get a letter in the mail that says, oh, I'm sorry, we just looked two years back in your tax return, your modified adjusted gross income was that dollar amount. And there's a chart that goes by and, and it breaks at different levels. First break is uh, 87000 for individuals, 177000 uh, and it changes annually as well uh, for people filing jointly. And again, this is two years back on your modified adjusted gross income. And so they're pulling from two years ago tax return that they have on file. Um, 
a lot of people see that dollar amount and stop reading and just get mad. Keep reading the letter. There's, <laughs> there's five bullet points on that letter that give you an option or a right to appeal that one of the most common is that I run into is people sitting in front of me made a good income, was over that level two years ago, but that was because they were working full time. They're either right. not working full time now or they've completely retired. And so their income is not anywhere near what that two-year tax return shows. And so um, you have the right to appeal. You will have to come up with some proof showing that you're uh, retired in that scenario. Uh, but you can take that down to the Social Security office or get all of them now over the phone. Um, and they're very good about adjusting that back. Uh, now, if it was a sell of that land, if you, you made that capital gain, you're going to have to write it out for the year. And it does work. You don't have to do any extra work. If you are tagged by the government for being in Irma uh, and you get that letter saying that you're going to pay this much for the rest of the year, come the end of, for example, this year, you'll get another letter looking at your 2019 tax return. And so if it drops under, then it'll automatically adjust down to the normal rate um, on its own. Okay, so, so if somebody is paying that right now in 2020, it's based on their 2018 tax return. And has it been your experience, Cameron, that if that 2018, let's say they were working full time and they were making 200,000 a year, a married filing jointly, um, and their modified adjusted, in, uh, adjusted income, let's say, as you, as you referenced, was over that threshold. And so now they get this letter where they're saying, okay, I, I, it's not just 140 a month, but I'm paying the surcharge both of us, right? It's on each That's person. Correct. Yeah, if you're and, probably and so, both, you're both paying. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, this can be a lot of money. You can be talking about maybe an extra 220 a month for each person. So for a couple, that's an extra five grand a year. Um, is it been your experience that if they'll go down to social security and appeal that and explain, well, look, my income was high because I was still working. I retired on January 1st of 2019, that they'll actually, uh, They'll, they'll use that as a valid reason to, to not ding you for that? They will. So I, I tell people, if you have a retirement card or retirement email, uh, something that shows that it, you are no longer working, or even if you just went part-time, a lot of people who stay with their company might not be putting in the 40 plus hours a week. They're just on the payroll, maybe a consultant, something like yep. that. And it took a little hit on the income. Going down to Social Security, as long as you have proof in hand that you are not making what you made two years ago, I have yet to have, and however long I've done this, I have yet to have anybody be told no and not wow. have great adjusted back. Well, that, that tip right there, folks, was worth the whole 30 minutes um, for those of you who this affects. Well, look, Cameron, we're out of time. I want to give you a, a minute just to, 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 to wrap up and just say, look, let, let's say I'm watching this. And I'm like, man, this guy, I don't want to have to figure this out. I want, I want to get some help with this. What does it look like for somebody to work with you? How do they contact you? What is kind of, let's end on that note. Yeah, easiest way is just to give us a call. Uh, phone number 512-868-4469, I believe. I'm pretty sure I never call myself. Um, <laughs> office is located uh, right in the center of, of Sun City here in Georgetown. Just opened another office right now. The Doors are not completely open due to COVID. Right next to the Social Security office in the Williamsburg Shopping Center between Social Security and Goodwill. Uh, but again, easiest way, make a phone call, uh, ask for me. We have agents here that can also answer questions if I'm out and about, but um, that's the easiest way. From there, we'll figure out the needs, we'll figure out the ones, if we can do it by email, Zoom meeting, face-to-face, -face, it's, it's whatever works for, for that individual. All right. And um, obviously, if any of you uh, can't, can't uh, remember his phone number or his name, all you got to do is reach out to us and we can make that connection as well. Cameron, thank you for your time. This was extremely informative. I think a lot of people are going to benefit from this. And uh, we really appreciate your being with us today. I um, hope you have a, a smooth enrollment season. It's coming at you here in a few weeks. <laughs> They, they're, they're always a little shaky, but I do appreciate having me on and uh, no, it's been fun. Yeah. Well, great. Great. You have a great day. Be safe. Everybody else have a great day. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.